Uh, delighted to uh, share with you some of my experiences in Washington in the past and what we plan to do in the future. It is true that uh, we sure could use some help in Washington. I'm optimistic that there have been some real good changes in the country already. Uh, and the grassroots seem to be uh, becoming more aware of what should be done. And we have new and better members in Washington. And yet uh, there's no evidence yet that the, the policies have really uh, changed. There's been a lot of activity. There were some statistics revealed uh, not too long ago about how many uh, more days and more hours and more legislation they've dealt with in Washington, but really uh, less uh, uh, concrete uh, conclusions to what what they've been uh, trying to do. There's still the spending is going on. Uh, when it comes to thinking about the budget, the, uh, the the debt limit, I cannot uh, foresee them getting into a stalemate on that. I mean, the debt limit, we can expect it to go up. I mean, uh, they're not going to close the government down, and they need the money, so you can be very sure uh, that the debt limit uh, will go up. And nothing really seems to change. Uh, that, that was sort of the debate in the early 1980s. I had been somewhat optimistic about the Reagan revolution. I was a strong supporter of, of Ronald Reagan's, and I supported Reagan in 76 and actually led the uh, delegation uh, of the uh, delegates to Kansas City when uh, he was uh, running a race against uh, President uh, Ford. But the, uh, uh, the period of time shortly after he was elected was uh, a time where there was some hope that something would happen and there, there would be a change uh, in the direction of the spending. In the early part of 1981, during the first budgetary process, I think probably even before the budget came up, uh, the bill came up uh, to raise the national debt at that time. And, uh, and, and Reagan and his... Uh, uh, aides came to the Republican delegation and said, well, we know what we've been saying in the campaign and we know we don't want this to continue and we don't want more debt, but you have to raise the debt limit for us. We have to raise it by, uh, which was the largest amount ever raised in our history at one time. And he asked the Republican delegation to go along with uh, the administration's proposal to raise the debt limit $50 billion. And, and that's still, you know, a, a fair chunk of money, but at that time it was astronomical that uh, it was going to be raised $50 billion. And, and, uh, and the promise was, and the explanation was that uh, this was not for the Reagan deficit, this was for the Carter deficit. We were just paying the bills for the previous administration and the current fiscal year uh, was still the, uh, the uh, Carter year. And uh, they said this will, and there was a, a promise made that this would be the last time they would have to come to Congress to ask for the debt limit to be increased because they were going to get the budget in order. And uh, yet before, uh, before I left Congress, uh, four years later, there was a request to raise the national debt and it was passed, and increasing the national debt at one time by $500 billion. So nothing, uh, nothing really ever changed. Matter of fact, uh, I think the rhetoric is even a little bit softer now. At that time, we really believe that a budget could be balanced that year or the next year, and it could be uh, taken under control rather quickly. And then we had proposals during the 80s to balance the budget over a four-year period. We had the Graham-Rudman approach that we would take four years and you know systematically cut back until we had zero. Well, halfway through... Uh, the first Graham Rudman resolution, it was obvious it wasn't happening. It was getting worse. So uh, they readjusted it and redid the Graham Rudman and stretched it out another four years, which came out to close to seven years that this uh, program was supposed to work. But by the time that seven years uh, uh, were, were up, uh, it was uh, not even discussed anymore because it was nowhere close. The deficits had continued to expand. During the eight years of Ronald Reagan's presidency, the national debt uh, actually tripled, and it was the most rapid growth in, in, in debt ever. And now the discussion is uh, the big contest is between the Gingrich proposal of a seven-year program versus uh, the uh, Clinton's proposal of 10 years. And, and they do this in a serious way. 
I mean, they pretend they're serious about this. And, and I'm, I'm utterly amazed that, uh, that they pretend that this is a serious discussion. Because in reality, there's only one budget that counts, and that's next year. I mean, all this pretense and proposals and tax projections and revenue enhancement programs and spending cuts and uh, predicting interest rates, it's all, you know, just a lot of gimmickry that's going on. But uh, they really still have hoodwinked the American people. You see articles and the stories of, of the Republican leadership are coming out and, and bragging that, yes, they have just passed in the House of Representatives a balanced budget. And they'll state it in that optimistic fashion. Yet it's nowhere close uh, to being an actual balanced, uh, uh, balanced budget. And the mentality is, uh, is such that uh, I'm afraid that's going to continue, although I've seen signs of encouragement with some, some new members of Congress uh, being there, especially you know, in the freshman class. In that same year of 1981, in the early budgetary uh, uh, votes, when we were trying to cut back, at least there, w there was this token uh, effort to cut back on the proposed increases, there was an effort made to cut uh, uh, the Democrats made an effort to cut welfare for the rich, so they had proposed all of a sudden to uh, cut uh, export-import bank. They said, well, if you're going to slash food stamps, we've got to slash food stamps for the rich. And this thing surprisingly passed overwhelmingly 100, by 100 votes. And they said that we're going to cut export-import bank. But um, that afternoon after it was passed, they interviewed somebody from Lockheed, and the lobbyist said, uh, they asked the the Washington Post asked the lobbyists, they said, are you really worried about this? They said, you really got a setback. I mean, you, you're losing some funds. It's important to your business. And the lobbyist was nonchalant. They said, no, this is no big problem. This only will give us an opportunity to show how strong we are and what kind of clout we have in Washington. And uh, that very night, uh, there were lobbyists. Uh, the business lobbyists called the Republicans, and the labor lobbyists called the Democrats. And lo and behold, there was a vote the next day, the same vote, and a hundred congressmen switched their vote, and the money was put back in. Today it doesn't happen quite that way, but it gets put back in. It gets put back in uh, maybe uh, uh, in the Senate or in the conference, and uh, the, re the cuts really are not carried out. One of the uh, congressmen at that time, uh, uh, a member of the Bo Weevil group from Louisiana, now a senator, uh, he was interviewed because he had, was one of the ones that had switched their vote, switched his vote. And uh, the uh, post reporter asked him, he says, well, um, uh, why did you do this? He said, well, I just went with the best deal. You know, uh, whichever way it was, he just went with the best deal. They said, yeah, but does this mean that your vote is, is for sale? And he stood up and he says, no, but it's for rent. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, I think, tells you a little bit about the, uh, the moral climate of Washington. Saying that with a straight face, putting on the front page, page of, uh, of the Washington Post, and then being rewarded by being promoted to the Senate with that set, uh, set of standards. So we still have a long way to go. The battle we have is both uh, political and educational. I think uh, long term it's, it's more of an educational uh, battle. And this is why organizations like the Birch Society are so important. Uh, Larry McDonald was absolutely right. Even in my very first race to Congress, it was very instrumental that I had individuals uh, from the Birch Society that helped me and campaigned for me because I didn't really have to get them excited or educated or teach them about the free market or teach them something about foreign policy because they already understood it. This does not mean that we will ever get 51% uh, uh, of the American people who will join and endorse the Birch Society. It doesn't happen that way. But the nucleus of people who understand the issues and become politically active and be willing to put the time and the effort and the money into campaigning uh, needs to be enough uh, to be of an influence. Uh, the uh, saying goes sometimes that uh, three or four percent of a population can literally sway uh, community leadership is important, ideas are, are crucial, and uh, that's why uh, teaching and educating uh, people as to the importance of ideas uh, is uh, so necessary. 
the, and, and this is where we've made a lot of progress. This is where I've been optimistic about what's happened the last several decades. I know in the 1950s I heard very little in the 1960s uh, with a little bit of searching you could come across materials and, and learn uh, the right kind of economics uh, different than what we've all were taught in our co college courses. But today uh, there are think tanks in Washington DC that are very libertarian free market oriented and very uh, a great number <coughs> of organizations that I consider on the right track. Uh, this is the reason why the American people are more receptive to these views and are more interested in in changing uh, the government. It doesn't mean that, <coughs> excuse me, that doesn't mean that we have clear sailing because we really have a struggle. We're facing a, uh, a crisis, I believe, here in this, uh, during this decade uh, where uh, this country will have to face up to the fact that we're literally bankrupt. Uh, we are bankrupt now, but we have still been able to borrow. Uh, it's the credibility of the country and the credibility of the money uh, that allows us to perpetuate this. But eventually, uh, there will be a limit to how much borrowing we will uh, be able to uh, in, involve, be involved in. If, if a country has the privilege of being a reserve currency, and we are that country, and uh, the dollar is the reserve currency of the world, it allows us to do a lot more borrowing. It allows us to uh, buy more products overseas uh, with inflated currency. But it also allows us to build a bigger financial bubble and uh, eventually uh, leading us into a, a period of time where we'll have to face, face up to this crisis. This morning's paper recorded that this last quarter we had a, uh, the largest uh, trade uh, imbalance in our whole history, which means that a lot of our dollars went overseas and we imported a lot of products. Now, a lot of people complain that, well, we have to punish the Japanese, and they blame the Japanese for, uh, for this happening. But the fault is in our system that we're less competitive and we have a currency that they're still willing to take. And if they're foolish enough to take it, um, that really, on the short run, is a benefit. And we, we have benefited economically. We've had uh, less inflation, and we've had a higher standard of living uh, be, because of it. But that will, that will eventually come to an end. Now, the, the uh, Japanese have been, uh, and other foreigners have been willing to do this because they have invested so much in this financial system. They don't want the dollar system to collapse, although uh, those dollars they're holding uh, can be uh, losing a lot of its value. Last year, the uh, foreign central banks bought four times as much of our government debt as did our own Federal Reserve. So this means they're willing to buy this and hold it and put it in reserve and take the heat off our own Federal Reserve. And this again gives us a free ride. Even in the area of printed money, the actual currency, uh, three-fourths of it circulates overseas. So if you're in Mexico or, or, or Russia or different countries like this, they're quite willing to hold greenbacks in their pocket, which again alleviates the pressure here at home because if that money was churning through our economy, you would have a lot more price inflation. And that just allows us to live on borrowed time and borrowed money for a while longer. There will be something in our future uh, down the road, probably within the next several years, that will precipitate a loss of confidence. Uh, early in this year, there was uh, evidence that maybe we were moving toward that, and the uh, dollar lost 20% against the yen and the mark in a very short period of time. Yet in the last couple of months, it's recovered that amount. But I believe in the long run, uh, because of the nature of our deficits, our, our currency, and that we're a reserve currency, and the balance of payment, and all these things add up, that the dollar will continue to go down. We will eventually get a lot of inflation here, and it will also lead to a financial crisis. The financial crisis will also precipitate a political crisis, because the, and, and this is what I believe the American people are anticipating. It was mentioned that three-fourths of the people are dissatisfied with the government and dissatisfied with the two parties. 
I think this is a uh, leading indicator. The American people, if not consciously, at least subconsciously, know there's something very, very fundamentally wrong uh, with our system and there's something flawed about Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and the whole welfare state. They can't quite put their finger on it and there are a lot of us who believe we unfair, uh, unfairly have to pay too much for it and the obligations fall on our shoulders because we are obligated to work and I think foolish at, uh, uh, for doing it, we work more than half of the year uh, for the government. Uh, we, we work just our income tax up until June, but if you measure all taxes and all regulations, it's like July 13th that we're working for the government and we're still pretty complacent about it. And that doesn't make us happy, the people who are productive and, and working. But then there are those who are on the receiving end. I think they're, they're concerned because they see the stories and they hear about it and they have common sense and they say, well, you know, uh, uh, this uh, baby boom generation, they're going to be retiring and there's not so many people going into the workforce. How much longer is this going to last? So there is a great deal of deep uh, concern about the, uh, the future of the country and I think it's uh, very legitimate. Our job, of course, uh, uh, for those of us who are interested in promoting the views of liberty and constitutional government is just to do a better job. Uh, to be able to present this in a fashion that people understand that the only humanitarian approach to good government would be to have a free society that protects individual liberty, not collective rights, not emphasizing the fact that uh, there's such a thing as uh, gay rights and women's rights and uh, minority rights and handicap rights. That is all nonsense and really a distortion of what, uh, what individual rights are all about. And until we get to that point of understanding clearly what individual rights are, I think it's going to be very hard uh, for us to uh, achieve uh, a victory. But uh, we'll, we'll certainly have the opportunity. The opportunity is coming. Uh, we see uh, the economic crisis building, but also, I think we also see this building internationally. Um, it, it, it presses me that people have as much concern as they have today because on the surface things are still looking pretty good. We don't have a bad depression on it, we don't have uh, a world war going on, and yet there's a lot of concern about what's happening inter internationally. Uh, and they're unhappy with our foreign policy, probably more so now with the breakdown of the Soviet Union, uh, <laughs> figuring that that uh, enemy is no longer there, so why are we doing so much? It baffles a lot of uh, people about why, why are we closing down uh, military bases here in the United States while building them up in other parts of the world. Why do we build bases in the Persian Gulf, maintain them in Japan, and close down Calais? And I think those are legitimate questions uh, because if the got purpose of the federal government, uh, one of the major purposes is to provide a national defense, it would make more sense that uh, we did the cutting uh, overseas and, move, and moving back from the exposure overseas uh, rather than uh, nibbling away at some of the projects uh, uh, here at home. The United Nations subject, one that has been uh, close to the hearts of all uh, John Birch Society members, is again in the forefront of discussion, not only because it's the 50th year, but because in the last several years there has been, due to the complacency of the American people, there have been gigantic leaps, uh, 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 both publicly and behind the scenes, toward one world government, and something we can't ignore. I spend a lot of my time dealing with domestic economic affairs and monetary uh, matters. Uh, I don't think they're the most important. I think the most important, of course, is the role of government uh, and, and individual liberty and the size of government and the scope of government. That, to me, is the most important uh, because if we don't have a clear understanding uh, of that, we can't have a good, healthy domestic economy. But every bit is equal to the importance of a sound economy and sound money and understanding uh, the evils of the tax system and how sinister the Federal Reserve is. We still have the internationalism that uh, is frequently ignored by so many Americans and I think it's become much more important in recent years. And if you want to thank anybody for that, I think we should thank George Bush because I believe George Bush has done a great deal of harm to us and benefits to the one world government people because he has made it uh, common language to talk about the new world order 
and uh, I still have a hard time uh, uh, being in a forgiving move, uh, mood when I think about his statements uh, dealing with the Persian Gulf War. Um, it would have been much more honest in an American fashion to say that uh, you, and, and argue the case that national security uh, was involved, uh, which I doubt, but if he, he would have at least argued that and used American troops to go and preserve national security, that would not have been as uh, easily challenged as his approach was, well, uh, this is important to world order, this is important to keep the markets open, this is important uh, to take care of this, and we'll have a vote in the United Nations, and they voted correctly, and they've given me my marching orders, and I will do it. He says, regardless, when they were getting ready to vote in the, in, the, in the Congress, he says, regardless of the way the vote comes out, we're still going to do it. If you want to vote for it, fine. I hope you approve of what I'm doing, and they will eventually did. But he made it very, very clear that the United Nations gave him the authority to do this, and he would uh, pursue it. A very bad uh, uh, step, uh, as far as I'm concerned. We see little hints now of individuals who are willing to uh, take a stand on this. I'm very interested in the case of Michael New, uh, the uh, young man that's stationed in Germany and has now been told that he will be sent to Macedonia. And he's a medic, and uh, they tell him that he will have to wear the uniform of the United Nations, their insignias and their uh, berets, and, and uh, he is in a quandary. He, uh, exclaims that uh, I didn't swear an oath to the United Nations. I've sworn an oath to the U.S. Constitution. I joined the Army for uh, patriotic reasons to defend the country, and uh, he doesn't like the idea, and he doesn't know whether he's going to go. But they have told him very clearly, you will be court-martialed if you don't go. That, to me, would be so important if he could just put his foot down and had the courage uh, to stand up uh, to this. Uh, it's dangerous because they may rule against him and he may end up uh, in prison. But wouldn't that tell us a whole lot if they are so bold as to say that the individual who swore an oath to the U.S. US Constitution is forced then to wear a United Nations uniform? And we've had recent votes in the U.S. Congress uh, that has uh, uh, reiterated that our president has the authority to put troops under, under the U.N., so as bad as a foreign policy might be that is an internationalist, aggressive foreign policy, uh, if, if it's done at least with the UN, uh, United States command, that is not nearly as bad as this giant leap over into uh, this one, uh, one world army and one uh, world government. When uh, GATT was passed, uh, when they were trying to get it passed, there was a full page uh, advertisement in the New York Times and uh, they said it needs to be passed, it's very important, it's free trade. I don't think anybody could ever accuse me not voting for the free market system ever while in Washington, and I am for free trade, but I was absolutely opposed to the approach of what they called free trade, this managed trade, special interest trade, both under NAFTA and GATT. But this advertisement that was trying to get everybody to endorse the concept of GATT said that we have to have this third and, and final leg of the New World Order, and they used these terms. And they said, we've had the IMF, we've had the World Bank, now we need this World Trade Organization. And this was so important to be passed. And then on those levels, uh, they, uh, they become very important, the Republicans and the uh, Democrats uh, come together. In um, my particular campaign that I'm involved in, this will be probably a major, uh, major issue. The individual I'm running against has voted at times 80% in support of the president. And yet uh, the establishment Republicans at, at the Washington level, even though many are, uh, are seen as and vote pretty conservative, they are doing everything conceivable and they have sent the message out that we do not want Ron Paul back here. And the reason is, is we cannot control him. And uh, I guess I either should be paranoid or be flattered. But uh, anyway, they do not want somebody who will look at these issues in this manner because uh, they are right. They are absolutely right that if the Republican leadership would support these issues, um, then uh, the finger has to be pointed 
at, at them as well. And when it comes to the trade and the international issues and the war and the Persian Gulf and all these things, this is where they blend together. And if you look at the voting record and the pattern of support that the leadership on the Republican side, it seems like in order to get to those higher levels, there is a certain amount of capitulation that they have to uh, go through in order to be able to achieve uh, the, the power status that they have. And right now, uh, power is, uh, is very important uh, to the Republicans because that is everything. Uh, maintaining power is going to be much more important to them than, uh, uh, than the issues itself. Uh, the uh, Constitution becomes less important. And yet, they, I'm sure, they can rationalize this and decide that this is in the best interest of the, uh, of the country uh, in order to go along. We have, we have a changing, uh, changing world, and, uh, and, and this is the reason why we do this. The other night on Ted Cobble's show, they had the story about the uh, United Nations type troops that were working, uh, that were having uh, drills down in the, at Fort Polk in Louisiana things that have been floating around for a long time, but they have not uh, been out in the open. And they interviewed one young man there, and he expressed some of the concerns that Michael New had about serving under the United Nations. And um, he um, uh, was then quickly uh, followed up by an interview with uh, Chairman of Chief of Staff, uh, Joint Chief of Staff, uh, Shally Kashvili. And uh, <coughs> Kashvili said, well, we have to understand that the world is a different place that we live in and that the American forces must be used for different reasons and uh, police keeping activities of uh, forces uh, united together now is an important issue, not just the defense of the United States. So it's, it's very clear that they want that message out uh, uh, loud, loud and clear to, uh, to everybody. The uh, <clears throat> chances of things getting changed in Washington uh, before a major crisis I don't think are very good. I think, I think they're going to limp along, they'll raise the national debt limit, and they'll have continuing resolutions. So they've done this for decades, and they're going to continue it uh, for a while longer. It's going to be continued until the conference is lost in the U.S. dollar. The weight will be put on the dollar, and uh, they will do whatever they can to keep it together, and there will be a lot of collusions among all the central banks uh, of, of the world. But the growth of government, I suspect, is going to continue. In 1965, there were 365 lobbyists floating around Washington, D.C. Today, there's more than 40,000 lobbyists. And uh, they, they, it's a good investment for big corporations. Uh, corporations uh, that I know about, many of them are coming back on research and development. And uh, very few of them, if any, invest in uh, sound economic education and trying to change uh, uh, the country in the way we would like to see it changed. But they spent a lot of money on their Washington operations because one change in the law or one contract or uh, one favorable ruling by the World Trade Organization, that can mean billions of dollars uh, for a large corporation. So the financial system, uh, as it's set up with a dollar-denominated system and fiat currencies as well as control of trade and control of foreign policy, that is, is, is well in place. But the other side of the coin is I think the sense of uh, patriotism and nationalism still exists. I think it's encouraging to know that the one presidential candidate who has been willing to address this in any way at all has been more successful than anybody thought, and that's Pat Buchanan. Uh, there are certainly some economic issues I do not agree with uh, Pat on. I happen to know him. I, li I happen to like him. Uh, but uh, like so many things, we do would have some, some disagreements. But I really admire him for being the only one willing to stand up and talk about some of these things and how, the Amer uh, how America uh, may be on the verge of losing uh, our sovereignty. And, uh, but I'm so pleased that this message is so well received. I think it's a more powerful message than some realize. Even in the little bit of campaigning that I've been doing down in the, uh, South Texas, in the 14th district, I've been pleased that uh, people are knowledgeable about NAFTA. I might have guessed, and I don't know how you feel about that, you might have thought, well, who would have ever even thought about NAFTA much? But there's a lot of people thinking about that, and they're thinking along the lines of <coughs> uh, United Nations that is much, uh, uh, much too powerful. 
We've had a, a fair amount of talk in Washington about how to pay all these bills and that uh, we are uh, now uh, needing to change our, our tax code. And I can remember back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s that uh, there, were, there were only a, a few of us who would be willing to stand up and say, you know what, what we should do first off is get rid of the IRS. Let's quit the income tax. And uh, people like uh, uh, Jim Collins and Larry McDonald and I and Steve Sims and a few others would go on a bill. And, but we were the oddballs. And then they would sort of laugh at it and ignore the whole thing. But now we have... Bill Archer, Chairman of Ways and Means Committee, who's promoting, trying to get out front and say, we, we need to do away with the uh, income tax, which I think is very good. But in the same sense, there's something awfully uh, confusing that two out of the three major leaders uh, on this issue, and that would be Dick Armey, who wants a flat, uh, flat tax and uh, keep the IRS in place, and then Bill Archer wants a sales tax, and neither one talking about the very, very high regressive income tax, it's called Social Security, and leaving that in place. Uh, all this, to me, doesn't sound like a concerted effort to really uh, change things. I think it's to distract us from the real issue, and that is spending. The only thing that really counts is spending, uh, long term. I would, uh, even with the current spending, I would rather pay uh, taxes through a sales tax than I would the income tax because it's such an evil uh, monster. But uh, as long as you need the revenues and as long as the government is there and growing and doing all these horrible things, uh, then I think we're in a serious problem. I think ultimately uh, what has to be done to see any changes, and I think at least uh, in groups like this we've already asked this question, we already know the answer, but the question has to be asked uh, by more Americans, and the majority of the Americans have to really decide this, and this has to be answered in Washington. And the question is um, not so much how we can tinker and, and make Medicare solvent and, uh, and, and change this uh, budget around so the budget comes into balance or collect revenues uh, less painfully. I, I don't believe much in that. I mean, I do my best to do what I think is best for at that particular time, but Ultimately, we have to stop and think about individual rights and we have to think about the role of government. What should the role of government be? Does the role of government have a natural ordained uh, right uh, to the power that they use uh, to bring about social and economic changes and to please the world? And the answer, as far as I'm concerned, is absolutely not. They do not have the moral authority to assume this power. Uh, power to go and do the things that they think are good. Some conservatives uh, think you should do something about personal lives and personal lifestyles and impose on people what they should do. And, and some liberals uh, think that they can manipulate the economy to make sure there's a fairer distribution. And both of them frequently get together and, and, uh, and, and work through uh, these international treaties in the United Nations always assuming that the government somehow or another has this authority, gained this authority to use this power uh, to try to bring about uh, changes. And they always couch these changes in moral uh, tones uh, and place themselves on the moral high ground, which uh, some of them, I guess, believe it, uh, but uh, long, long term, it's really a distraction and a negative because the more the liberals worked on uh, the war on poverty, the uh, more poor people we've had in the country. If you've, uh, and the more they've made an effort to improve education in this country over the last 30 years, the worse the education has gotten. So there is no moral high ground left for those who would like to use uh, this uh, authority and power and force uh, to uh, bring about uh, changes. The only authority the um, government should have, and the only power that the government should have, and this whole issue is about power, the only power and authority the government should have is that which is explicitly given to the government through the Constitution. It has to be an honorable contract, and the, and the contract has to be followed uh, by the members of Congress, and following the Constitution is the only thing that we promise to do when we go up there. And yet 99% of the time, the individual is spending time uh, trying to get reelected and satisfy his special interests and knowing how he can uh, raise, uh, raise PAC money. And uh, unless, unless this, uh, this is addressed, and if the conservatives go to Washington and concede to them that they have this moral authority to use power, 
then I don't think we can win. I think that's why there was such a failure in the 1980s. It was always this tokenism of saying, well, that program is $35 billion in uh, food stamps. What we need is a $30 billion food stamp program. Well, the argument has to be that there is no moral right for the government to be involved in this. There's no good economic uh, explanation for it because it doesn't really help, and it's not in the Constitution, and that program ought to be abolished. And we should have more and more people take that approach and stand up to it and argue that. Not that I believe that we would achieve that, that they would automatically come over, but I think you would more likely have some backing off. They would be put on the defensive, and they would have to defend uh, the program on moral principles. Now, the con as long as the conservative goes and argues that we need to just cut back waste and fraud and save a little money here and, and do this, I think uh, you've conceded, uh, they've, they've conceded the, the whole argument, and they can't win. This argument is going to be more appropriate because I expect the welfare state to end. Uh, I really don't think we can afford it. And uh, it's going to end. Uh, I don't know whether it will be as cataclysmic as the end of the uh, Soviet Union, but it very well could come uh, to an end uh, with, with a crash, and then we're going to have the opportunity, I believe, to present a case uh, for a, a system of government that was uh, outlined by our founders, and that is one of very limited government, and one where there would be sound money and where, where there would be no special interests protected, that individuals have rights and not groups. Uh, under those circumstances, even if there is a loss of wealth, which I expect to continue, because there has been a loss of wealth in this country already, and uh, not everybody has felt it, but the lower quarter percent in our country has already felt the, lower, the lowering of their standard of living. And this is an economic and a political phenomenon that is going to con uh, continue. But even if we lose more wealth, which I think we're going to, if we do the right things and have the right fundamentals there, uh, it, can be, uh, it can be brought back to uh, health rather quickly and, and uh, we can uh, gain once again. The jobs don't have to go overseas and industries don't have to close down. Uh, those things could all come back here. It has been bad policy. It's been bad economic policy in Washington, bad monetary policy, bad foreign policy, and governments run amok because uh, the special interests are entirely in control, and now the country is coming, uh, becoming broke. So if, um, if we recognize this and know what to do, I am rather optimistic that uh, we can uh, you know, restore prosperity to this country. I find it fascinating uh, uh, that uh, we live in a time like uh, as we do now. I think it's different uh, and unique in many, many ways. Uh, we have seen a century where government has grown, uh, uh, you know, by leaps and bounds throughout the century. We have seen the disintegration of the Constitution. We have seen governments abuse our rights endlessly, and uh, that is going to come to an end. And uh, we will also now participate in the saving of and the rebuilding of this country. And it shouldn't be all uh, negative thinking in the sense that, you know, we can't do anything. Because we really can. We can do something about it. And we should be optimistic in that sense. And even if, uh, if tomorrow we don't achieve it and we don't achieve it as quickly as we think, I think it's so important that we participate in it. And that's why I believe societies like the John Burr Society are so important because not only are we working for a positive goal and a positive end, uh, we also get the benefit of like-minded people coming together. Because if you have to spend all your time looking at C-SPAN and watching how Congress operates, that could be depressing. But at least if you can come together and conspire a little bit on how we're going to change this, maybe we can have some enjoyment doing it. And I thank you very much for having me today.